My drug of choice was adrenaline. My drug of choice was the family. That's bigger than almost any drug out there on earth. And the adrenaline of driving in a car cross country, 2,000 plus miles, 100 kilos in there, and you're the only one in the world in that state that knows is there, you know, that adrenaline rush is beyond dope or anything for me. I don't use drugs, I don't drink, I don't touch, I don't taste or nothing, but that was my drug. Athletes and entertainers and politicians go through it. Drug dealers too. They're all kind of the same because they have power and people want their power and people want to be around them. And the reason the stupid shit these people do is because they don't get too many no's. Like, just think, any woman in the world, almost, you can be with. Like, in any country, you if, if you wanted her there with you right now, you could fly her in. And some don't even want money. They just want to be around you because you've got the power. Because you can make it happen at any time. And it might make someone else who's going to give them some money want them. Yeah. What's going on? Yeah. And then you got to think, it's an insatiable appetite. Whatever you want, like, because you got money, it's the world is the is your oyster like anything you want you into women you could have 10 women or every city you go to you can have two women three women whatever you want you know like if if you're into cars like how many cars do you want you want a ferrari on each coast you can have it miles in the life is a documentary is the documentary is the story of redemption from the crack house to morehouse to you know, making wrong choices, BMF, and just being totally intoxicated with the life. Then prison, and then making that decision that, look, I'm gonna turn my life around. I'm gonna be a father to a son that I haven't seen essentially for five and a half years. I'm gonna be the best son I can be. You know, we wanna see that, that story that people don't show. They always show, you were a drug dealer, then you died. We wanna show that, look, this is where I came from. I came from a crack house, but this is what I've done made some wrong choices and is the story of triumph and redemption of you can change if you want to you know i had an 87 month sentence 66 months or five years six months and 19 days not that i'm counting i did uh six months in a halfway house i fought the federal government in the district court twice for an extra six months in a halfway house so so where were you born and what was childhood like uh, i was born in brooklyn new york um, childhood. Well, like what, like go on and tell yeah. you know, give us the details. Yeah, I was born in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, what we neighborhood? Were, we were kind of like black gypsies. We lived everywhere from 145th Street and Harlem Sugar Hill to Gowanus Projects, more important than Bed Stuy. Uh, like and this would have been what? How how old were you? I'm 46. This was in the 80s. Oh, so you were as. So let's see. I was 10 in 85. You were uh, 12 in 85. Mm -hmm. So right as the level of criminality and drugs and violence was going up yeah. in inner city America, you were right at that yeah. age. No, we were in we were in, in the heart the, of it. We were in the golden ages of it when the world turned upside down. If you look at police killings and all the rest of this stuff and incarceration rates, when crack cocaine hit, they didn't even have laws for it. It was a everything was decimated in the black community. Everything switched upside down. When you had women uh, and men who were functional people, it was the night of living base heads. Yep. You know, it was like dead woman, dead man walking every day. And you, it sounds like you were living in uh, areas where, you know. No, not areas. We, no, no. We were in the crack house. Ground zero. Yeah, we were in a booming, booming all day, all night crack house. Now, for the viewer, what do you mean when you say you personally were when in the When I say house? you personally, as in my fucking bunk bed in that crack house apartment, 417 Baltic Street, apartment 2B. My mother, who is an incredible woman who has 21 years clean now, she's the lioness in the AA and NA meetings who hasn't touched a drug since June 27th, I think 1998 or something. Um, my mother smoked crack every day. When she didn't, when she wasn't smoking crack, she was drinking. When she wasn't drinking or smoking crack, she would sleep on a detox. If she wasn't doing that, we were doing the family business, boosting clothes and whatever we could sell. That's what we did. And when you're a child, this is normal. 
when you go someplace else and you see people that have meals on the table, nobody's fighting, nobody's stabbing each other, nobody's stealing, nobody's smoking crack, those people are abnormal. Because your life is, every time I come in the house, somebody's smoking crack. And ski, so, because I had periods in my life, not that long, but enough to have a taste of it where it's one thing when you go outside of the house to face danger. But when you're inside the house... No, it was more dangerous inside of my house than, than it was outside. Because it went down every night. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a night that went by that somebody wasn't smoking crack. And not just, you know, drugs are communal, right? So when you smoke crack, you smoke crack with other people. You know, at the end of the night, when the stem ain't got, when you ain't got the crumbs or the residue, it's going down. It's wolves. And, and it runs when, out. Yeah, when people smoke crack, they smoke crack till they drop, you know, until their body no fails satiation. on them. Yeah, it's no, mm, mm It's not like weed, like, okay, I'm high, let me no, no. sit here for 30 no, 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 minutes. No, 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 it ain't, brown. yeah, it ain't no, I'm stopping for the night, hey, we're going to shut it down. Crack house go all day, all night, as long as there's crack there. It's going. And I assume your mother would probably let dealers set up there in exchange no, no. for... Or she was the dealer. She was the, the, the best customer. She was the dealer. And if you had crack and you wanted to smoke someplace, she smoked your crack until your crack was gone. And if you didn't go out, you were forcibly beat out. By? By whoever was in the house. Yeah, that's, oh, was, that's the life. That's, is, that's, the, li that's the norm. See, mm -hmm. people is like, well... That's not normal. You don't know normal till you go outside of your community. That's why people do so much fucked up things because that is their normal. And until you see different, you don't do different. You know? But it took me to see different. Now, how tell us that? I mean, mm -hmm. I, I have the ringer off, but instead, someone texted me, let me turn this whole stuff off. So, what was, what year and what was the transition out of that? gypsy life in New York the year was between 85 and 86 I was fortunate that uh, my father had family in st. Louis my father didn't live with us uh, they were separated and nobody really knew like nobody knew oh, what was going on yeah because crack it happened so fast, happened so fast. Your mother was pretty normal yeah you know and the world changed you know so my father sent me to St. Louis, and he sent me one summer to St. Louis, and he sent me to a summer in North Carolina. And when I saw people that lived in houses, that weren't fighting each other, that weren't robbing each other, that spoke, that had food on the table, when you're in a crack house, you don't, the things when you pour, you know when you pour, when you don't have salt, when you don't have rice, you don't have pennies in between the couch. Because change is always around, but in a crack house, it's fucking water if the water is running. That's the only thing you have abundant, you know? So when I went other places and I saw other schools where people weren't robbing each other at school, they weren't fighting at school, I said, shit, it's time for me to go. So I, I was fortunate that I had a family that would take me and my mother and father agreed. Because what a lot of people really don't understand is that the kids that are in those situations, they're in survival mode. They're doing whatever they can to survive and whatever feels good, you know? So they, they kind of can't be accountable because they're like, look, I'm just trying to survive. You know, when, when you can bring a stolen bike or a body home, you know what I mean? It's what rules do you have? So when you go to school and somebody's trying to tell you to do something, Sit still. yeah, you don't get told that at home. You can stay at home. You can do whatever you want. You want to drop out? You can drop out. Stay here. You know, and that's the story that with miles in the life that we want people to see that. Where did you come from? And the reason you're doing some of these things is why? Like who, at what point when you have a hundred kilos of cocaine in a compartment in a limousine, do you say that is okay? It's because you were trafficking at six years old. I started trafficking at six. What would tell us? Tell at six years old in New York, is kill or be killed. So you this gotta is be like what, eighty? No no, no I'm I'm forty six, so this is like seventy eight. Seventy eight, seventy nine, right? So the Rosses used to have the weed back in the day and they used to have them in these little bitty manila envelopes. And they used to have tray bags. So I was a really smart kid, good with numbers, and you have to be, because 
you got this big city and your kids are all around it. So my mother gave me three $1 bills. She was like, go next door to the next building and get me a tray bag. So, and that's what I mean, the norm. So at six, your mother's sending you to get drugs. Yeah. And then you're thinking, how can I make some money out of it? Well, I'm not even thinking how I can make some money at that time because it's normal. It's just like your mother go to, go to the store to get me a, a soda. Weed is like a soda, you know, go get her some weed. And when she would smoke it, I'd sit at her feet and I'd get a contact, you know. So to traffic that 100 kilos, because I had time to think while I was in those prison cells, I thought back at my childhood and said, the reason this wasn't something crazy when you got two million in a car and you're going cross country to drop it off to pick up 100 plus kilos or whatever is because I had been doing this as a child. Yeah, it was normalized. Yeah. You normalized it. It was just what we did. Yeah. Yeah, when you, you know, are trained to respond to the slightest insult or $5 owed to you with violence, that's why as I got older, like, you know, oh, you're mad at me? Well, I'm going to try to set your house on fire. Mm -hmm. And it was, there was no proportionality. Yeah. You take and you owe me a dollar, I'm going to try to hurt you. Yeah. Not, I'm going to try to get my dollar. In no middle ground. Yep. Yeah, and that's what it was. So, you're about uh, 12, 13, 14, and you're in a more normal environment. But you said it was North St. Louis, which is a bad area. I went too, from right? Beirut to Baghdad. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't know it. For me, you got to think, I'm coming from the projects. They gang banging every day, and I'm on from the north side. You know, I'm off from Grand and Bailey. You in know? St. Louis. Yeah, in St. Louis, right near Fairgrounds Park. What age did you arrive in St. Louis? I got there at summer of 86. And the funny so you're thing... You're 13? I'm 13 going on 14. But the funny thing is, it hadn't hit in St. Louis yet. So when I say I went from Beirut to Baghdad, when I went from New York and the projects, when I went to St. Louis, they were banging hard. The cocaine. Bloods and Crips had came from Cali into St. Louis. Cocaine. So, but even for me, I still thought it was a great place. Because I went to school in the suburbs, wow. right? I went It's a voluntary desegregation program. So I was like, ah, oh, this thing is. But what happened was, crack followed me. So in 87, bam, crack hit St. Louis super hard. So the world turned upside down again, again for me twice. But I had, a, I had a base in the home. My grandmother was there, my aunts were there, and it was an assault every day. Because I was this wild kid. That was drinking back then. I did. I was 13. I was drinking because I did what I wanted to do. I stayed out all night. And the first time they were like, "You can't go buy beer." I was like, "Why not?" <laughs> we buy it in the city. Yeah, in New York. We we bought beer. We, we bought whatever we wanted. And when they told me, "Hey, where you going?" I'm going where I'm going. You know, where you gonna be? I'm gonna be where I be. Nobody told. Nobody asked me when I was 11, 12, 13. Where you going? It's go because you go. You know what I mean? So. It was a culture shock. And when I went to high school out there, I had never been around white people. I was like, man, white people. White people kind of cool. It was like someone came off the TV yeah. screen. Yeah. Because I, cause I, it was always around West Indians, blacks, Latinos. And I saw white people on TV, but it was no other than teachers, but it was no white people in my community. I thought white people were cool. They're like, hey, dude, you want to borrow my car? <laughs> you know, so, and they had microwaves at school. I had never had a microwave in my house, and they had them at school. Like, kids had cars. 16-year-olds, they had parking spaces at my high school. It was like Beverly Hills to me. I just know I had never been in a place where you've got 2,000 plus black men that are as smarter than you or smarter. But I had never been in that environment, and I loved it. Who in America has a holiday named after him? Dr. Martin Luther King. He graduated at 19 from Morehouse College. Um, Maynard Jackson, former mayor of uh, Atlanta who got the Olympics here. So Morehouse has some phenomenal um, Benjamin E. Mays uh, men that have come through there. Uh, they've done some world changing things, you know. So you successfully graduated with what degree? Graduated. International Studies. But after I stopped running track, I was on my knuckles. You, you, know. uh, you while still at Morehouse? Yeah, while I was at Morehouse, I, had a, um, I was on my knuckles after I finished running track. And I had a cousin who was one of the biggest drug dealers in St. Louis. His name was Q. So he moved in the 
late 80s and 90s, late 80s, the Miami boys came to Atlanta. In late 90s, the Detroit boys and some of the Ohio cats and a lot of the Chicago and St. Louis guys came to Atlanta because we could wear jewelry, we could have Bentleys or whatever. Because you could, because there were yeah. black celebrities yeah. and legal money that it wasn't yeah. like, who are you? Yeah, you didn't stick out. Yeah. If you had a nice car, politicians, could be uh, corporate people, athletes, entertainers. Same. So a lot of the drug dealers came here and because I lived in the hood and I ran track, like a lot of these guys were like star football players. They just started selling drugs. So what oh, happened? Oh, you mean? Uh, yeah. Okay, this is in St. Louis, or this is here in, in St. Louis. So what happened was, the streets got them. By the time they graduated, they're like, "Fuck college! I'm going to make this money." By the time they're 18. The crack economy. You got to think. I got to wait all of this time. I can get this today. Right now. So all of these guys I knew, because of my cousin, because I'm from the neighborhood. You know, we all were athletes so I knew them so they turned to selling drugs so when they came to Atlanta they knew me they trusted me and I was that guy mm -hmm. everyone's kind of migrating to Atlanta yeah. and oh you're already here I'm already you're already here. going to Morehouse so you yeah. bump into these guys so and I, I like to go to the clubs so and I had a, a valet parking business I started in valet in, in, yeah in college so I'm at all of the clubs because I'm working. So you're really entrepreneurial. Yeah. That age. Yeah. So everybody knows me because of my cousin Q, because I'm from the hood, because I was an athlete in St. Louis is a small circle and St. Louis is small. So everybody knows everybody. So I'm down here. So then, you know, they all smoke weed, right? I'm at all of the clubs and restaurants. So I'm now I'm the weed man. And then my cousin is Q. He's the biggest drug dealer. So I'm, I'm into a world where if I wanted to buy 10 bricks, it might take somebody on a corner all their life to get to two. I already have access because I sell them weed. When they want to go to clubs, I go to clubs. I know all of the girls, so I'm putting it together with the girls. I'm selling the weed. When they need guns, I got the guns too. You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm working, but I'm really working towards the other side too. Even in Morehouse, you're already getting in. Deep. Yeah, and, and what happens is in life, you're one way and then you try to change and you become another way and then piece by piece you become that person who you were before and that you didn't want to be but the life is calling you because you're on your knuckles you it's like you work at this restaurant where millionaires and billionaires come every day and when that opportunity comes or that illusion of the opportunity you want in you like shit I want the cars, I want the houses, because they all trust you. So you're at their six-bedroom house, you know, because they trust you with their cars, they're like, look, I'll be back. Back might be two, three months, so you got a Mercedes, Cadillac, whatever. It's like, hey, I'll be back. And they trust you that much, it's like, yeah, you can drive a car. What the fuck you gonna do? Drive it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, okay, hey, man, just stay at the house. I just want somebody there. So I've got access to all of this and I'm not all the way in yet. And Atlanta's boom, this is what, 92, 91? Yeah. Atlanta's, this is the boom years. Everyone's yeah. coming, they're getting ready for the Olympics, they're building mm -hmm. legal money, illegal money, probably just easy yeah. to do stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's flowing. This is Atlanta milk and honey, you know, so. So you, but you graduate from Morehouse. I graduated in 1999 because of my cousin and being out, everybody knows me. And then I bump into my, my good friend. He, he could have went to school on um, football scholarship or basketball scholarship. He made a different choice. His name is Rap. He's j Bo, right? So he's oh, right yeah, behind, he's, he's right behind Meech. So him and I hook up. And what year was this? This was 97. So he's already with Meech at this point? He's not. He's doing his own thing, but him and Meech and all of us are still cool. This almost mythical man, Meech, he comes to Atlanta and drops five cars. Like brand new, like brand new car, cashed out, everything, full body kit. Back in the day, S500, Lexus, Bentley, trucks, all of this stuff. And he ships all of his cars. From? From California. And this so, is 97? 97, 98. So he ships all his cars, so all of us know each other because Detroit, St. Louis kind of click up. We're out in the clubs, they kind of click up. 
and relationships start, relationships start, relationships start. Yeah, so St. Louis and Detroit, because we're so close and everybody's here in Atlanta, everybody's balling, right? They start kind of coming together, you know, because it's not too far. You from the Midwest, I'm from the Midwest. Suburb. Yeah, you know what I mean? And St. Louis and Chicago guys aren't really tight tight, but St. Louis and Detroit guys are tighter, even though Detroit is further. So when Meech came, we kind of knew each other because at one time or another, Meech would come to St. Louis or the back when Meech wasn't big Meech and they would get work and everybody kind of, you know, I, I might need to get 10 from you or my connect or my connects went bad or they on a whole pattern, something happened at the board or whatever, but I still got to supply my people. But you got them, your number may be higher, but I can get it Tied sometimes. It yeah, it's, it's back and forth. You know, what you said was 100% correct. Like sometimes you may serve me, sometimes I may serve you, but I'm my own boss. It's not like we're really all part of the same crew. So when you're everybody, more of a you're more of a friendship crew of all yeah. you happen to sell drugs, mm -hmm. and yeah. you're just doing business. It's like the other. country club, yeah. like the country club for drug dealers, the strip club. You know what I mean? That's where the deals go down because everybody know everybody. I see you balling. I see you got money. I see who the robber boys are. Is the whole inner workings, and now we closer, and we can work with each other. Like sometimes you're like, hey man, look, I'm down here. Hey, you know, you got any, any choppers or you got any pistols? Because you don't want to go no place without no pistol. So you're like, oh, my man, this, this, that. So the small things are, hey, you got the smoke or you got the pills. Man, they got some good pills. So it starts going there on recreational stuff, not work. It starts yeah. out like that. Yeah. You know, because we hit, we, you're having sex with the same women. It's a circle. You know what I mean? You with this chick, you with at that. the same store. Yeah. You know, you're going to the same clubs. You're going to Justin's, Diddy Place. you go going to Magic City. You, back then, Club Nicky's or the Gentleman's Club, you had all these places, so we start getting familiar and everything else. When does it really start to coalesce? And at this time, you're still owning the car service. Yeah, still have the valet parking yeah. uh, business. Um, was that just, in the end, was that just kind of a front? I mean, was it making significant money, or was it just it was, a way for you to be places? You know, the truth, it was making good money. You could have you could have just stuck with that. I could have just stuck with that. And had a nice upper middle class. Yeah. Life. At the time I had the highest I had was like eleven accounts. You know what I mean? I'm working, I'm doing this, but you know, it's kinda like Bill Gates. You know, he's got billions. Like, why don't you stop? What's better than money? Money. More money. Yeah. Back in the day. When you're in that mindset. Yeah, when you're and what's better than Coochie? More. More and new Coochie. That was my mindset then. You know what I mean? Like, you don't ask Bill Gates, you don't ask Rupert Murdoch to stop. They billionaires. That's what they do. Right? That's what they do. Same thing. So the appetite, you know, is what drives a lot of things. And so you got to think, okay, I got my regular car. I got my regular apartment. But I'm staying in a million-dollar house. I got a $100,000 car. And when all of the jewelry is there, I got a $20,000 watch on. Right? And I don't get any no's. Like when we go on vacation, hey, you want to, it's like, hey, you want to go? All right, let's go. What, what the Call the girl and just give her your name. That's it. Just give her your name. That's it. All you got to do is show up. So we want to go to Cancun when all the ballers used to go to Cancun, yeah. Miami. It's just, hey, give her your name. Or when you're in a strip club and first time, it's like, hey, you, you want her? It's like, yeah. Oh. What, you don't want her? You know, so it's like you go in the VIP room. It's whatever you want. Like, oh, man, just keep that. Hey, just give him the change. Change might be from whatever, $2,000. Yeah, $2,000. It took you, when you were violin, you were making good money. In the 90s, if you made $200 a day, that was decent. $200 a day cash. Now you just got $2,000. That was the change. Nothing. Just because you're just, cool. Yeah, because you're my man. You're in the mix. When does the it it go from being this loose assortment of friends who are drug dealers to coalescing? I mean, did did it feel like without going into the intricacies? At some point, it must have been that Meech and his brother got a bigger, more steady, big supply, and then and then or, and then did the rest of you guys kind of then be started working for them per se or was it never really like that you know in this biz well in that business somebody's got to die or get killed go to prison 
or get sent home for you to get in because everybody has a job you know you play your position so I had a I started a limousine company I always had a, a business mind so I was like look valet parking and limousines kind of work together and I always love cars hence I own a body shop right now collision center so I got limousines and I was doing good there but I got a little lazy because I had years ago I had started working a little bit for my cousin and that money came fast and it came hard and fast you know so you make a thousand <clears throat> an so, hour is no kinda... you you do a 19 hour trip from Miami and you got oh you mean for your cut or oh, your yeah. cousin was of a significant yeah. level he was actually capping out of state I mean he yeah. wasn't just the yeah. big neighborhood dealer he was no. working at a national a city deal himself yeah so you work for 19 he around uh, he's in prison now He's alive. Yeah, he's alive. And yeah, he's alive. Great True guy. Form. Yeah. Stone Cold Thank Gangster. You. All day. Is he coming home soon or? God willing, he'll be home yeah, this bit. Yeah, nineteen and some change. And we talk about going through the Wayne County Jail, the, the how bad it was, and you starting to realize I can help others. Mm -hmm. And then you taught in federal prison yeah. and got so talk about yeah. the prison experience. Wayne County so, Feds. Wayne County Jail was the worst county prison jail system in the country and the best for me and where's that at? it's in uh detroit michigan so that's where the pain came yeah out. that's a we were uh the majority of us were sentenced in the eastern district of michigan in the city of detroit and most of us were housed in the holdovers but primarily in wayne county they got something called the rock it is probably the closest i've ever been to homeless and sleeping on the streets it's so bad there that they have this this like holding tank where you sleep in a boat you sleep in a plastic sled. boat it's like a sled right and you got a little mat inside of there there's no hot water and i had to use back then they had newspaper people would read newspaper i had to use newspaper between my flesh and my socks to stay warm like my feet were that cold that was the first time in my life i had ever seen a man get beat naked to beat your clothes off i mean literally Beat the man what, what did, bloody. What you know what I don't know? I do know. I remembered. It was a young boy named Carlos. He kept it was a dude. He wasn't old. He was in his thirties, but he kept messing with this young dude. And the young dude snapped. And he beat the brakes off him. I remember. The way it was was it's some medieval stuff in Wayne County. Bars on this side, bars on this side, five bunks, two to a bunk. The toilet is in the middle. You know what I'm saying? Like open toilet open shower so you take a dump oh it's not even against the wall that's right no it's right in the middle you got to put up sheets to tie the oh, covering wow. yeah man and yet the toilet if the the dude has the bed closer to the toilet it's like maybe four feet if that away you know what i mean like you gotta defecate wash your hands brush your teeth all right there so the, the guy ten guys ten guys you know what i'm saying you eating there you sleep in there you shower in there the, the shower is only hot from 3 a.m. to 5 a.m. in the morning. You got young boys that's in the shower that when the officer comes by at like 4 some o'clock on account, when they know it's a woman, they stay in there, excuse my language, until, so they primed up so when a woman comes by, they can skeet. It's the wildest, but, and the food, man, I, I lost 30 pounds in there, and I'm a thin guy, right? The... I met some of the most humble, incredible killers. And, and and in there, I mean, in Detroit jail, like, almost everyone is looking at a long stretch. Oh, yes. Yeah. It's and, all serious cases. Yeah, and these dudes don't play. Most of them have gunshot wounds, and most of them, they're just waiting to get out to hit the lick. Once they get that chop in their hand, they're killing anybody. But these were some of the best young men I've ever met that... They just needed some guidance. They just needed somebody to cuff them and be like, hey, man, let's let's do something different. You know, these guys yeah, were... You were able to a little bit... Yeah. How, what what sort of things were you able to ever mingle with them? I like it. I never thought some people couldn't read. I thought that was something for other people. Because I had a college degree, you know what I mean? And I graduated from high school, I graduated from college. But I felt really honored and privileged that some young men would come to me and be like help me with this word or they were really saying i really can't read too good like help me with this and like one of my 
proudest moments in my life is when I helped a guy write his lawyer. He was facing a case and everything. I helped him with his discovery. Um, and he said his lawyer put the, the letter up on his wall because he couldn't express in, wor in, in writing what he was trying to say. And I helped guys write their parents, write their girlfriends, you know? And that's a, that's a big thing because when somebody can't write or read, it comes across like you're a third grader, you know? And they feel embarrassed, but I was trusted enough. It was the first time I ever used my college degree, like, in my life. Because I had always had businesses so you, and stuff. You, the first time you used your college degree was to teach people in jail. Well, that's a good use of your yeah, college yeah. degree, but that's Great. kind of ironic. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, it was a blessing, though. I don't, I don't, I don't turn my nose up at any of it that I did. You know? So, as you segued into federal prison, where were you at? And then you became more of a teacher. Did you have any rough experiences there? Was that a little easier? We're talking about the teaching and yeah. getting ready to... Uh, how people are not prepared to re-enter society and how yeah. that you did or didn't. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the reason that I didn't have any pro problems is because I respect people. I don't allow to talk to people. I'm going to bring it to you if you bring it to me. I don't gamble. I don't steal. So I didn't have many problems because I'm on... You're not into the fellas. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not into the, to the guys and stuff like that. And I'm not looking at no other guy yeah, 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 yeah. that another guy is ready to kill for. Like, and they are. They ready to kill. Like, hey, that's are you ready to die for that man? Like, they really on some look. This is my woman who's a man, but I'm ready to die for them. So I didn't do that. So I didn't have any problems. But um, I've been on, they call it con air. I've been on con air. They call it diesel therapy, where it could be three months before you get to your destination. You're in county jail. You're on a plane. You in khakis and a teacher. You don't, you, and you lose a lot of your rights because you're in transit. So because you're considered for for your... To get visitors, that means they would know where you're at. But if you're moving, you're considered a break... Like someone could hijack and break you're you You're in Missouri. You're in um, Sandusky, Michigan. Sandusky, yes. Ohio. Oh, yeah. You're in... No, no, I think they got a Sandusky, Michigan. Sandusky, Ohio is where they have the amusement park. park. Yeah. See, oh, here's the Sandusky, Sand Michigan. You're in Sandusky, oh, Michigan, where they like, no, this is a town. I was like, no, this is a city. They said, no, this is a town. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. So you're in places like that. You're in Oklahoma City where... Oh, they're just pulling into like a local jail. Yeah, you're... And they pay them to hold you for a couple of days. Yeah, you're all around the country. <laughs> oh, wow. You're all around the country, man. Oh, that must be very disorienting. Man, it's disorienting. You like a punishment? I know they did it to me sometimes where it was a punishment because they considered him as whatever ramble rousing with inmates. But yeah. did, did, did you were you on diesel therapy much? I was on diesel therapy because I had to go back to court. Oh, like, so, I was in prison. So much therapy, it just yeah. But it was you because there were so many indictments or whatever. Yeah, so you back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and it'll drive you crazy because you're in different environments, different people. Like you're on the move, man, and you would you beg to get to prison, a a stationary place where you at. No matter how bad it is, you just want to get to one place instead of Sandusky, Michigan, to another county jail. On the plane, you go to Leavenworth, or you go to, you're in India, then you're in Missouri, then you're in, from Missouri, you're in Oklahoma City. You're in, they have a, you never touch free ground in Oklahoma City. When you get off the plane, you walk the gate, you got two gates, you walk into the prison. You never touch free ground. Then you're there, then you go to Atlanta, which is the worst holdover in America for the feds. Then you're there. Because it's old and we're awful. Yeah, and what they do is they slide the trays underneath the, the door. So what the food sometimes catches on the bottom of the door. So the rats at night, the rats are eating on the bottom part of the door because the food is stuck there. And so it's supposed to be two people in a room. When you start out, it's two. Then about eight, it's three. Then about after 12 o'clock count, it's four, then five. Then you going up to take a piss, a man head is right near to come yeah, off. That's where you said. You know what I'm saying? So, nah, it was. But in Atlanta, the Atlanta camp, uh, that's when I started teaching officially. Um, I hosted slam poetry, talent shows, you know, uh, Apollo night. What I was really doing was I was giving back to my community because I had been there for a while. The officers trusted me that I could put this on and bring everything together. They, 
But what it was, because I wasn't on no crazy stuff, I had a mean hand. Like, I had privileges that other people could do, but I wanted to use my privilege to help others. Like, when women and men come into prison, it's their first Christmas, they ready to kill themselves. Yeah. They ready so to do I, themselves. Yeah. yeah, so when you got a talent show and you see other people like you and they you realize that life's not over. Yeah, because, like, dudes are ready to kill themselves. Like, off the muscle, they like, I ain't living no more. You know, guy got 10 years, his wife done left him, he ain't talked to his kids in months before he got there. It's like forever when you're at the beginning of it. Yeah, man. You know? So, yeah, that's that's what I was most uh, well, proud of when I was in prison. I wrote a book, too, also. What's it called? It's called Miles in the Life. Oh, oh that's the book. Yeah, yeah, I wrote a book. And then which became the documentary, which everyone should go see. Yeah. Or, I mean, should watch online. Mm-hmm. Um, talk about the lack of, well, recidivism... And the lack of preparation you and other inmates received before leaving and your advice to maybe soon to be returning citizens or guys who are freshly out or if they people that have a loved one that's gonna get out. Yeah. How can I think what you need to do is you gotta have a plan. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. A bad plan is better than no plan. You can't say, I'm gonna prepare myself when I get out. Like if you've been in prison, it's just like saying I'm going to run a marathon. That's 26.2 grueling miles, right? You can't say I'm going to run a marathon today and then run it tomorrow. You got to sign up. You got to pay the fee. And some marathons, you got to qualify. And you got to train. Like, you can't say when you're in prison that I'm going to prepare when I get out because it's too late. First thing you're going to do, you're going to go back to the block. You're going to go back to what you know. And like I say, the word trap, Webster defines as a almost impossible place to escape. So why would you go back to the trap? Because that's familiar. So you got to change. And A and N, they say people, places, and things. I've coined the phrase, trademarked soon, traps, homeboys, and guns. Because you can't be around a gun. I don't care who you are. Unless you get a pardon from the president of these United States of America, you can't own a gun. You can't go to the trap. Four things going to happen. Smoke crack, sell crack, get caught in a crack conspiracy, or kill somebody or be killed. It's just like going to the barbershop and you don't want a haircut. You don't need to be in a barbershop because one day you're going to get a haircut. Same thing. I don't. I can't sell a dollar rock. I can't sell an ounce, a gram, a kilo of nothing. Because all bets is off. I don't care about nothing else but getting this money. You know, so what we're doing, we've got a program called 10 Ways to Stay Free that's coming out this spring. And we're giving it away free to all the prisons across yeah. the world. A prisoner for one year spends 8700 and 60 hours in prison, right? You did 10 years, that's 87,600 hours. The prisons may have a one hour or two hour pre-release class. How do you, I've, I've taken all of this time to become a super criminal, like learning about different crimes, doing my crime better, who got popped, what did they do, what did they not do, right? And you release me and you ask me to get a job. I've never had a job, I've never had a check in my name, I've never had an interview, and I've never had a bank account. I've taken people in this building that I've hired that never had any of those things. Guys that melt down plastic before they can get some steel so they can shank somebody to protect themselves and suitcase it. Right? They're in the bank shaking in their boots. Like, what do I do? How do I sign a check? What's an ATM card? What's a debit card? Like, what do I... Like, are you serious? Like... To work at Quick Trip, you got to know how to work a computer. Go to the gas station. Yeah. You ain't never had an email address. So they don't know how to turn on the computer. Like, what? That's like Sam. They're afraid they're going to break it. Yeah, like, I don't know how to build a hundred story building. Same thing, computer. It's daunting. For us, it's easy. Like, we know how to do that stuff, but. It's because we're used to it. Yeah. But look, like me, for instance. My father went to prison. My mother went to jail. My brother did two bids. My other brother went to jail. I got one brother that didn't out of four brothers. So my whole family. So you usually do what you see. So you got to see different to do different. And that's what we try to do. We pr- try to provide as credible messengers to women, men, and juveniles that, look, it wasn't an easy road, but this is what I did. I own a house. I own a business. I'm married. I've got a book out. I've got a documentary out. I've got custody of my son. These things are possible, but it's going to take a lot of work. And you're going to have to outwork everybody. 
Period. When you go to a job, act like you own it. Treat it like you own it. The boss is the should be the hardest working person in the business because they built the company, right? So you, I don't care if you sweep in floors, sweep the, the best that you can. You'll never have to worry about a job is if you act like you the boss. Work like a boss. That's what I say. That's one of my tenets on 10 ways to stay free. Work like a boss. And so we've got an, another documentary coming out called How to Stay Free. Free from the judges, from the successful returning citizens instead of ex-offenders because we're returning back to society and we're still a citizen. My citizenship doesn't get taken because I was in prison and I come home, right? So I'm a returning citizen. Like we're just trying to help people like us. We're serving the least, the last, and the lost. And we're saying, look, you can get on YouTube and watch about gangsters and people killing each other or Instagram models. You can go on YouTube and watch this. And we're providing it to the prisons for free. They don't have to pay one dime. It's in your budget because you got to pay zero. You know? So that's the thing. That's the path that we're on. We're trying to serve the least, the last, and the lost. And people like us. And we're credible messengers. Because that judge, they don't identify with that judge. They identify with me. I'm from the projects. I lived in the crack house. I've been to prison. I didn't have money. But I also ate at soup lines and soup kitchens. So I know what that is. I know what it is when your mother on crack and you got on dirty drawers at school. Because who checking for you? You're fucking 10. Like, your mother and your father's supposed to wash your clothes. You know what I'm saying? So for me, when I went to prison, I had to hand wash my stuff. It was a giant zipper. I had done it before. You want to clean clothes, you got to get some money. Go to the laundromat. Man, I didn't have a... I didn't live in a house till I was in my teens... I didn't have a washer and dryer until I was 17 years old. I mean, had one until I was 30. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't live in a house that had one. The projects ain't no washer and dryers. You know what I'm saying? I'm used to incinerators on the floor. Laundry, man. Yeah. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? So, in a bathtub. Yeah. You know, so we're trying, to, we're trying to pivot and help people make that change. You know, and for them to look at you and say, well, you know, if he could do it, I could do it too. That's our biggest thing, like. Because you don't identify with LeBron James or you don't identify with Michael Jordan because they're not tangible. You you don't see them. You see them on TV. You might wear the You can't be them, but you could think you could be a real businessman or a yeah. man. Yeah. You could see Lil D or Lil Tony on the block. He got the best car, the best girl, the the wheels. He got the best house. He eats the best. He got the best clothes. He got the best jewelry. Cool. Is the... Illusion of opportunity, that's another one of mine, is the illusion. That's what you see. So that's why the crack economy is so strong. Because it's like everybody in my neighborhood, underemployed or unemployed, and they're miserable, and they never have anything. So Lil D and Lil Tony, they ain't miserable. They out here balling. You know what I'm saying? They smoking good, doing everything. I want to be like him. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to change the narrative. And we're taking control.